Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 35. Just a quick, quick um, synopsis of what we went over last week. Genesis chapter number 34. Of course, that was right after they had arrived in Shechem. Uh, we saw that Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. We saw the grievous sin of fornication. And then uh, also we saw that uh, Simeon and Levi, they made things a lot worse. They, of course, went in and they slew all the men of the city and committed a very grievous, grievous sin. Uh, here in Genesis chapter number 35, a lot of things happen that are just totally unrelated to that. Uh, it's, so we're not really sure exactly how much time goes by or when these things happen as far as uh, the exact order. Oftentimes, uh, more often than you would expect, uh, especially if you're new to reading the Bible, uh, things are not always in an exact order. Sometimes you're given a, a, just a brief description of events that are going to be taking place and then the events will be written down and recorded. So here we have some, uh, some things I would assume that they're in order, but here we have some unrelated events that all take place in this chapter. A lot of uh, different unrelated things and, and uh, things of while he's dwelling in the land here in Genesis chapter number 35. But primarily what we're going to focus on that takes place here in the beginning of the chapter uh, is going to be the rededication of Jacob. Jacob really goes back and he really just makes things right again between himself and God. This is him returning back to Bethel. I want you to look here in verse number 1. Genesis chapter number 35 verse number 1. It says this, And God said unto Jacob, Arise! Go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God. So it's interesting there. Notice that God is saying this. He speaks in the third person there. It says, And make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Now we're going to look at that event because that's of course recorded in Genesis chapter number 28. So here he's in Shechem. That's where he settled down if you remember the area of Shechem. And we see that God comes to him and now he's telling him, hey I want you to go where you had made that altar. Because if you remember correctly before he built an altar before sacrificed unto the Lord. Things happened in Bethel before. He built a monument at least uh, which he set up the stones, the pillar. And right now he's being commanded to make an altar unto God and then, it, and then he finishes it with, That appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Look at verse number 2. It says this, Then Jacob said unto his household, And to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, And be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, And I will make there an altar unto God, Who answered me in the day of my distress, And was with me, in the way which I went. So now we can see that Jacob is steadfast that he's going to be going to Bethel. We can see that very clearly that, that Jacob ha is determined to go to Bethel. But notice what he does. He goes and he commands all of his household, all of those that are under him, all of those that live amongst him, whether it be family, whether it's his sons and their children, or whether it's his servants, all of them. And he goes to them and he says this, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. So what is the implication there? The implication is, of course, that there are strange gods there, right? He wouldn't be making this command. You would assume that he's, he's giving them a command, hey, these strange gods that you're worshiping, put them away. So let that sink in for a minute, that those that are among Jacob, now we don't know who this is, but those that are among Jacob, there are some of them that have strange gods among them. Idols or what have you. Of course, I, I talked about this just a couple of chapters ago. I spoke about how even a saved person can have an idol or maybe uh, even carry an idol around. Or, uh, you know, whatever they do to it, dedicate an idol, put an idol up in their house, whatever it may be. There's the warning at the end of 1 John. And, you know, it tells you, you little children, keep yourselves from idols. He's speaking to saved people. And he, cl he clarifies that in first, uh, early on in 1 John chapter number 2. These are saved believers that he's writing to, right? So can a saved person get mixed up in this kind of stuff? Of course. We saw Solomon. He did this well as well. So what do we see? We see him commanding them to put away the strange gods. Now, I've been speaking about uh, you know, Jacob stepping up to the plate and being a leader. We've seen that repeatedly. We saw him kind of get be a, a, a little bit of a pacifist for a while with Laban and then finally he stepped up and he decided hey I'm gonna be a leader now at this point I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna do what I need to do and we see that carrying on in this chapter as well now he's going to all those of his household obviously these people are under him right he's able to go and give them this command you know what he tells them hey we need to clean all of this up you know these strange gods you need to put them away 
right? This is his job. Now, prior to that, obviously, they shouldn't have been having these strange gods in the first place. Go to Joshua chapter number 24. Joshua chapter number 24. Uh, Jacob should not have allowed them to be uh, uh, worshiping or even keeping or whatever they're doing with these strange gods in the first place. But nevertheless, we see him being a leader. And what's he doing? He's standing up and he's commanding his household. He's standing up and he's saying, Hey, this is not right. This is sinful. This is wicked. However he words it, put these strange gods away from you. He's making sure that those that are under him and that are amongst him, we are going to serve the Lord. He's making a decision here for himself and for his household. For him and for all of those under him. His family, his household, all of them. We see him again being a leader. Look at Joshua chapter number 24. Is of course the famous passage, most famous passage in the book of Joshua. Look at verse number 14 first. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. So now he's commanding all of Israel as well at this point. But then notice what he says in verse number 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which were your father, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But notice this. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So notice Joshua's telling them, he's commanding them as the leader of Israel, but can he force them to do anything? Of course not. He's not the individual leader of their households. Just like how you have a pastor here, the leader of the church, right? I can't force you to do things in your own house. But guess what? My family I can. And I'm the head of my household. And all the men, all the leaders of their home, they need to step up to the plate and they need to be a Jacob and they need to say, hey, we're going to put away all the strange gods from among us. We're going to put away all the filthiness. You say, hey, we're not worshiping idols. Well, then you need to go find out what those other sins are or if there are sins. Hey, if you're doing good, then good. That's great. That's wonderful. But you know what? As the leader, it's your job. You know what? You need to make sure that the strange gods don't get in there in the first place. You need to not allow the strange gods and the sin and you know, the leaven to creep in in the first place. You, as the leader of your household, you need to step up and be a Jacob or you need to step up and be a Joshua and say, hey, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to serve God. You know, be, we need to be men today. We need to step up and be Joshua's. We need to step up and be Jacob's. We have enough men walking around that are, that are posing as men. You know, they have the chromosomes for, for being a man, but they're not actually being a man, right? They're not actually acting like a man. We need real men, especially independent fundamental Baptists, representing the God of the Bible, representing the truths of the Bible, representing the truth of the gospel. Stand up and be a man. G give a good representation of what a good family is supposed to be like. And to be honest, it starts with the father. That's where it starts. It starts with the dad. I'm sure you're familiar with the statistics of, you know, if a father gets saved, if the whole house is unsaved, the rest of the fam family is 94% more likely to get saved. This is actual statistics that, that people have done. I've seen variations of these, but they're all extremely similar. Extremely similar. If the father doesn't get saved, of course that goes down way, way, a, a massive amount, but the mother does and the father does not, I think the rest of the family is like 25% likely, the children, to get saved. Do you see the difference in those numbers? It is insane. It is crazy. Do you know why? It's because the man is designated and he's been set up in the natural course of things in this earth. The family knows that the, the father's the leader of the household. He's the one that is setting the example for the household. So you know what the men need to do? They need to step up and they need to be the man that God wants them to be. They need to step up and be the Joshua. They need to step up and be the Jacob. They need to go to them and tell those in their household, hey, we need to put this sin away. You know, we, you, you know, you know there are different areas that can be, you know, uh, um, that, that we could relate this to. Very common areas of life. You know, dress and clothing, right? Don't allow your daughters to wear things that are not all right for, for that are not, uh, you know, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, appropriate. Don't allow your daughters, uh, 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 fathers, to wear things that are not appropriate. Don't allow your wives to wear things that are not appropriate. Hey, the Bible's super clear. Nakedness is from the loins to the thighs. That's nakedness. Don't allow those under you to, to do that. Your family. Your, your, the women in your life, whether it be your daughter or whether it be your wife, step up and make sure that you clean these things up in our lives, right? Amen. You know, uh, I believe it's very plain in the Bible. Women are to wear dresses. 
I believe that it is a sin for a woman to wear pants. Do not allow your wife, do not allow your daughters to wear pants. Man. You know, I believe this is clear in the Bible. It's obviously outside of the scope of this. These are, these are clear truths. Nakedness, loins of thigh. These are, these are just basic things that men get walked over to, on today. Th these are just basic things where men just don't stand up and say, hey, you know why? Because they feel like, hey, this is going to be a confrontation. Stand up and be a man. Be, that, be the leader of your household. You need to be more worried about what God thinks than your wife thinks. Right. You know, hey, I love my wife, but she's not, she's not going to stand in between me and right and wrong. She's not going to, you know, put herself and pit herself in between me and God and try to get me to choose between the two. It's not happening. Amen. My household, whether they want to or not, is going to serve God. Amen. And here, and this is what it comes down to. Even if your child doesn't want to serve God, they're serving God anyways. They're under your household. They serve God. They wake up in the morning and they say, I don't feel like reading my Bible. You better get your Bible and read it right now. Amen. They wake up and they, they don't feel like praying. You better pray right now. You know why? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't care whether you're interested in, in, in coming to church or not. You're coming to church. Right. You don't like coming to church? Too stinking bad, you're coming to church anyways. Tough apples, you're coming to church. You know why? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Make a decision as the man of the house, we're putting away the strange gods. We're putting away all the filth and the smut and whatever it be, CDs, DVDs, you know, movies you shouldn't be watching, put it away. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Jacob made a decision, hey, stuff crept in, I'm getting rid of it. I'm getting things right. I'm getting ready. You know what he's doing? He, and we're going to get into this. He's getting ready to make a big decision in his life where he's going to start serving God again. And right now, before he goes up, he's like, you know what? Before I go up to Bethel, we need to get things right. You need to look around. Sometimes you need to stop and examine yourself. Where am I at in my Christian walk? Where am I at? What am I like? Sometimes you're not paying attention. You let things creep into your family. You let things creep into your own personal life. You need to stop. You need to look at yourself, examine yourself, and say, hey, how did I let this get here? It's getting out. This is not allowed in my household. This is not allowed in my life. It's not allowed in my family's life. It needs to be put out. It needs to, you need to get rid of it, right? Go back to Genesis chapter number 35. Genesis chapter number 35. The other thing I want to I point out here, you know, you notice he says, put away the strange gods that are among you. And he says, and be clean and change your garments. This is always a sign of uh, spiritual uh, uh, cleanliness. It's a sign of your righteousness. Even in the New Testament, you talk about uh, putting on the whole armor of God. You know, we have the sign of, of Adam and Eve's righteousness when they have the fig leaves, right? And then God clothes them with righteousness, doesn't he? That phrase is actually used. God uses that phrase about himself, you know, being clothed in righteousness, right? This phrase all throughout the Bible is used. It talks about uh, being given white garments, right, in, uh, in the book of Revelation. What's that speaking of? It's talking about, it's obviously speaking about your righteousness. Oftentimes, uh, go to Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. I think it's Zechariah uh, 3 or Zechariah 4. This is one of the greatest examples where you can see this taking place. <clears throat> uh, we can see uh, the clothing, the raiment, if you will. Uh, here It's Zechariah 3. We can see the clothing or the raiment here uh, being a symbol of their righteousness, or of his righteousness. Look at Zechariah 3, chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath, I'm sorry, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. That is a beautiful picture of salvation as well. What we see here is his, he said, I have caused. I want you to notice the, the, work, the wording right there. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. You know what takes away our sins? It's not you turning over a new leaf and changing your life. It's God taking away your sins. For we're, we're speaking about spiritual salvation, God's the one that wipes your slate clean. He's the one that takes us and separates us from our sins. He's the one that takes the righteousness that we have and He gets rid of it. He causes it to pass from us. But not only that, just like the sermon I preached about imputed righteousness, He doesn't just leave us naked, right? We have nothing to wear. No, he clothes us with a new garment. He clothes us with his righteousness. Amen. You know, that's why he talks about putting on Christ, right? He clothes us in his righteousness. He gives us a white garment that's clean and white as snow, right? Representing what? 
Christ's righteousness. Representing His righteousness. He dresses us in Christ's righteousness. That's what we see a picture of right here. Notice He does all the work. He does all of it. When Joshua was standing there, how did he look? He, he had his filthy garments is what he had. That's what he had. The other night when I was giving the, the gospel to these, these, these two uh, Filipino ladies, they were struggling at the end. They kind of started going back. Uh, you know, and I haven't had this in a super long time, but they've been churched is why. And they, they started going back at the end to like, I asked her the question, is there anything else you have to do besides believe? Because I like to make sure that they're sure. So I'm, I'm asking them the list of questions, of course, at the end. And I was like, is there anything else, anything at all? And she's like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you know, try to be a good person. And I was like, and then I went into this big thing explaining to them, like, like, then I really hit it home, like, you're not good. You're not good, didn't I? I spent like five minutes, like, you're not good. And you could tell they started getting it. I was like, yeah, I, I a moment ago, uh, uh, you know, talked about how we're all liars. But if I could see into your mind and all the things you think about all day. You know, uh, I'm going to quote Peter Ruckman for a moment real quick. I remember Peter Ruckman said one time, made an impression on me. He said, if you could, think, if you could see all the things that I, think to, if I, that I thought today, you wouldn't let me stand up here and preach to you. And you wouldn't let me be your pastor. And he said, but hold on. If I could see all the things that you thought today, I wouldn't want to preach to you either. That's the truth. That's the truth. And if, you're, if, you're, you know, if you say it's not, then you're being dishonest with yourself. And that's why I told her, I said, not only do you sin you know, daily in the actions that you do constantly, numerous times today, I said, if I knew the thoughts that you think and that you thought today specifically, they were bad. They were real bad. And you know, she started thinking, I could see her, the gears turning, and she was getting like, yeah... They are. You know why? It was convicting her. You know? And uh, I was just pointing out the fact, hey, we're, none of us are right. The Bible says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's what God says. Do you know what you look like when you try to stand before God? Like, hey, look at all the great things I've done with my life for you, God. You got a bunch of filthy garments on. You look disgusting. That's how you look. It's the truth. That's how you look. You try to stand before... All the people are going to stand before God on Judgment Day. Do you know what the people are going to look like when they say, Lord, Lord! Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? They're going to be standing there just looking disgusting and filthy and just dirt and scum, just disgusting. Right. I mean, that's the truth. Read Romans 3. Get into your own heart and see what you really are. That's how man is. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing, said Paul the Apostle. Nothing. Nothing's good about you. Nothing besides Christ. Now, I'm not saying you can't do good every once in a while, but to your core, you're a rotten, sinful person. The, the heart is deceitful. It's, dece it's desperately wicked, the Bible says. That's, that's the description of your heart, my friend. The Bible is a book from beginning to end about sinners, sinners, sin just people just doing horrible things. Cain and Abel, the, the first generation, one kills the other. Then you just got a couple of chapters later, you know what you have going on? God's like, I'm wiping this whole stinking planet out. You guys are terrible. You're wicked. Look at the stinking, uh, uh, just the tribes of Israel. In this chapter alone, you have Reuben sleeping with his father's uh, concubine. You have Simeon and Le Levi killing a bunch of people. I mean, all of them. Then you have them selling one of their brothers into slavery. They're lying constantly. They're doing deceitful things. Look at Jacob's life. He's not a good person. He's a, you, know what he's, you know what he is? He's a filthy person. He's a sinner. He's rotten. He's bad. That's, I mean, do you know what Judah does? And Jesus is a product of this relationship, my friend. Judah goes and he sleeps with his, with his uh, what was his ex-daughter-in-law. His ex-daughter-in-law thinking she was a harlot. And then of that relationship was born Perez and Tamar, of which Jesus came of that line. So that's Reuben, Judah, Simeon, Levi. That's in order the first four tribes. You know why the other ones just aren't mentioned very much? Um, they must have done worse things. They weren't recorded in the Bible. Think about that, my friend. That is mankind. You're not a, you know, that's why you need to be careful about your own heart. That's why you need to put your flesh in check. When you realize the capabilities of, I mean, look at David. He's a bloody man, committing adultery, doing all sorts of wicked things. Don't get this pious, puffed-up attitude 
Their flesh is the same as your flesh. There's no difference at all. Both of them came from Adam and Eve. The same sinful desires that dwell in your flesh dwell in these people. The same things they did. Hey, you might have different proclivities or inclinations. You might have other desires, but you are desiring wicked things just like they do. And daily you think wickedness. You do. That's your mind. That's your thoughts. That's why we need to read the Bible as often as we can. Amen. Wash our minds. Put as much in that to try to get that filth out of there. You know, the washing of the water by the word. When you try to trust in your own righteousness, you know what you look like? You look how Joshua looked when he stood before God with his filthy garments. So you know what you need to do? Go back to Genesis uh, 35. When it's time to get things right in your life and, and, and you're getting ready to have a revival, you know what you need to do? Joshua was the priest. He was going to be standing before God. Jacob's preparing to go up to Bethel, which is known as what? You, I'm going to get into this in a minute, but what does Bethel mean? Does anybody remember? <clears throat> the house of God. That's what it means. He's going there. It's almost like he's going to be in God's presence. You know what you need to do beforehand? Hey, what did, Joshua, what did uh, Jacob say? Change your garments. Change your garments. Before, when that, the very first thing when that revival begins, you know what you need to do? You need to get the sin out of your life. Yeah. You need to get the sin out of your life. Fathers, be the leaders of your, ho your household. Get the sin out of your family's life. Get the sin out of your family's life. Get the sin out of your life. Take responsibility for your family. Take responsibility for yourself. Look here in uh, Genesis chapter number 35. We're going to keep going. So we see there, that's what that represents, the changing of garments. It represents uh, standing before God in cleanliness. Standing before God in righteousness. Just like Joshua is going to be a priest. He's going to stand before God. He needs that white garment, right? Look at verse number 3. And let us arise... And go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. That's the best thing to do with your sin, is to bury it. Get rid of it. Put it far away from... You know what? This makes me think of uh, the New Testament, the teaching on not making provisions for the flesh. Put it somewhere where you can't go back and get it. Don't put it somewhere where, hey, you know, I really like this movie and I, you never know if I'm going to backslide. You never know how this is going to work out. People think like that. People really think like that. I'm not ready to just totally get rid of it yet. You know, don't give it to somebody else if it's junk. Right. You know what you need to do? You need to bury it. You need to break it up. You need to get rid of it. You need to put it somewhere where you're not going to get it again anymore. That's what you need to do. You need to get rid of it. <clears throat> Bury it. Look at verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. If you remember that Jacob was actually fearful of that, that the people are going to come and destroy him because of the acts of Simeon and Levi. But you can see that the fear of God was upon these nations of Jacob and them. And uh, you can see here, you know, uh, being a man of God as Jacob was and serving the Lord. You know, we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear. We have nothing to be afraid of because he's going to tread down our enemies because the Lord himself, he'll put the fear into a lot of people. Now today we live in, of course, uh, uh, a time where, where people mock the Lord. They make fun of God. They'll laugh at God. But even like Jeremiah, what did the Lord tell him? He, he tells him like, hey, fear not. Neither be dismayed at their faces, right? Tells them, preach it anyways. Amen. Even if somebody doesn't, even if, even if the fear of the Lord is not in someone, and you go to someone's door and you're, you're, you're soul winning, or you're talking to a family member, or whatever it may be, and you're sharing something you know, with them, just because they're not afraid of God doesn't mean that, he, that He's not worthy of fear, or He's not a terrible God, right? Instilling terrible into people, able to make people uh, fearful. We serve a God that is, that is a powerful, mighty God that is able to put fear into people's hearts. He should, he should put fear into our hearts as well. Look at verse 6. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. Now notice that's the promised land. That is Bethel. He and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled 
from the face of his brother. Of course, El there in the beginning, that means God. And then it's Bethel, referring to house. I want you to go back to where this was mentioned in Genesis chapter number 28. Genesis chapter number 28. I'll say this to you while you're turning there. If we, if we think of Canaan, what does Canaan represent? Canaan re represents uh, the haven of spirituality, right? The bastion of, 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 of spirituality or of blessings. You know, it is the refuge of, of, uh, of, of righteousness, right? That's what Canaan is. It's the promised land, right? Now, here we're going to see uh, what Bethel represents. But what this would be is we see him going back there again. So what is that like? That's like returning back to your spirituality. That's what that's like. That's like a return back again to the things of God. And notice what he does beforehand. Hey, we got some problems. Some issues crept in. We got to get rid of them. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go back to Bethel. And we're going to go there and we're going to, we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to make an altar. We're going to rebuild an altar. And we're going to serve the Lord. What this represents is a revival in his life. Jacob was backsliding, allowing the strange gods, allowing all of this. You know what? He said, we're going to get this right. We're going to make this right. Look at Genesis 28 where this actually took place. Look at verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. We saw that also in Genesis 35. It, and then uh, it says, verse 20, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So a couple things I want to point out about this. Number one, I want to point out, like I said, it's like he's returning back to his spirituality. Returning back to, what is Bethel? It'd be God's house. It's like returning back to what's God's house in the New Testament? The church, according to 1 Timothy 3, right? It's the church. That is what God's house is. It's the pillar and ground of the church. It's the, uh, the truth. It's the local New Testament church. That is the congregation. That is God's house in the New Testament. Now, no one here, of course, is struggling with falling out of church, right? You know, you know uh, it, I, that, that's a good thing that we don't suffer with that problem where people are, 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 are out of church for five months, six months, and then they're, then, then they're coming back to church, right? But you can still make application of this. Don't think just because you come to church every week that you're immune to backsliding. You can still be just as much of a backsliding heifer as you know, somebody else that uh, fell out of church, right? That's not going to church. You can be coming to church every single week and still be backslidden. Yeah. Every single week and you could still be backslidden. You know what happens oftentimes is you come to church and it can become a routine every week. You come to church and it can just become, hey, this is what we do weekly. And you're doing the same thing last week as you're doing this week. You know, we got three services. We got to knock these services out. Check, check, check. And you got other things in your life that you're focusing on. But, but you know, while coming to church, is your heart really in it? Even while you're not at church, are you walking in the Spirit? Are you doing the things that are commanded of you? Are you reading your Bible on a, on a daily basis? Are you serving God daily? Are you praying daily? I mean, these are core essentials to the Christian life. These are core things that, 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 that we as Christians should be doing on a daily basis. We should be reading our Bible every day. Right. We should be soul winning. You know, Amen. routinely, all the time, we should be, uh, you know, finding opportunities. We should be going any opportunity that we have. So, soul winning is, is, in the New Testament, soul winning is the Great Commission. Amen. We need to be going soul winning as often as possible. Amen. You know, that's, that needs to be what's important to us, and we need to have a fire about it. That's right. You know, it's not just check. You could be going soul winning and be backslidden. Right. You could be going soul winning and soul winning. Sounded like I was from Kentucky for a minute. You could be going soul winning every week and be backslidden. You could be. 
You could, you could technically even be reading your Bible daily. That's still possible and be as backslidden as can be. You're not paying any attention to what you're reading. Not, so not only, so you have a couple of ways that you can examine yourself. So not only could you still just be attending church and then not doing all these other things that you should be doing, but it's still possible to be fulfilling these things and not doing it in insincerity and in truth. Not doing it with zeal. Not doing it with, with the love of the Word and loving God's Word and meditating on it day and night. There are people that aren't even saved that read their Bible all day. All the time. They read it every day. What are they doing it in the flesh? You could do the same thing, get the same flesh. You know, probably what would be more applicable here is just doing it in the first place. You know, we get caught up into the things of life, right? You know, we get caught up into, into work and whatever it may be. You know, uh, just family. We need to make sure that we, our priorities stay right. We need to make sure that God is the most important thing to us. And our fire lies with, with, with the Lord. And what is, makes us passionate and what gives us zeal is God and His Word. And, and you know, uh, uh, prayer, praying to God, we, that should be important to us. You can come to church three times a week and be as backslidden as can possibly be. You can come to church and we couldn't tell a difference between you and another guy. You look just as good. You got your tie on. Besides, brother, oh, you got your tie on. You're looking nice, right? I have to do that. I do that every time anybody doesn't have a tie on. You know, you, 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 could, you could be coming to church and, and I can't even tell whether you're backslidden. I don't have a clue what's going on in your mind. But you know, during the day, you're just watching all this worldly stuff. You know, during, you know while you're driving around in your car, you got a bunch of worldly junk you're listening to. All these other worldly things you're consuming your life with. You could be just as stinking backslidden. Just, don't think just because you come to church all the time and look down upon all these other people that never go to church. You could be backslidden too, my friend. Yeah. And you know what you need to do? You need to rededicate, just like Jacob did. Very first thing, get the sin out of your life. And then it's time to get back to where you were before. And sometimes, you know what's scary is this. You know what's scary is in the Christian life, there is no, uh, there is no real average, Right? You just can continually grow. God, you know, you have the ability just to spiritually just continually grow. You're never going to meet the perfect man, the complete man, right? That's what our goal is. You're never going to get there. So you have the ability to just continually grow. And I mentioned this before. I got this from my cousin who's a pastor. You know, this is the scary thing. If you're in Bethel at this point, let's just say on the chart, this is where you're at. You're at Bethel. This is your spiritual peak. This is the first time you're there when you're fleeing from Esau, if you will. Right? When you, when you backslide, it goes like this. It doesn't go... It, you're backsliding. It, well, technically backsliding like this, right? But as far as, you know, a, a visual imagery here, right? It's not like this. And then when you're at Bethel, oh, I'm, I'm back. You know, we're just picking up. The point is you're not just going to pick up right where you were before. When you fall out of church or when you even just backslide personally in your life and you stop reading your Bible as much, stop meditating on the things of God, stop going soul winning, you become a worse soul winner. Do you hear me? If you stop soul winning for six months, you're going to be a worse soul winner than you were six months ago. If you stop reading your Bible for, let's say that you, you're reading it four times a year, you do that for four years, if you lessen that to where now you're just like reading it a half a, half a time in one year, you're going to know less Bible. Right. You're going to forget a ton of stuff. This is a huge book. I forget things all the time. I make a note. I read through roughly every three months. I'll make a note one, you know, one time reading through. I'll read a note. I don't even remember if it was like the last time I read through. or I read notes in my own Bible all the time. I'm like, I don't know if I wrote that or not. No, I know I wrote it. But I don't even remember saying that or thinking that at all. This is a huge book. You know what you need to do? If you're in this, this, this backslidden place, you need to get all the sin out of your life right now. You need to make the decision. I'm getting all of it out of my life. I'm getting right with God. I'm going to change my garments and everybody around me that, that, that is under my authority, I'm going to change their garments too. I'm going to get rid of all the junk and all the filth. You know what? I'm going, not only am I getting rid of this stuff, but I'm going back to where I was before. I'm going to get back to where I was. And then from there, it's just an uphill battle, buddy. There's no stopping. You just continue in the Christian life. You keep fighting and going forward. Get back to where you were. 
Amen. Notice what he had to do. He had to go back to the same spot because that's how it is. You think, oh, I'm, I'm going to backslide for six months, have some fun, go out on the, you know, on the town. I realize no one here is thinking that, but you know, amuse me for a minute here. And then I, when I come back to church, everything's going to be the same. Nope. No, it's not. No, it is not. You just back, you're, you're, now, you're, now you're way back here. Now you've got to strive to get back to where you were. It's a bunch of just uh, of lost time of your life. That's what it is. You're losing time in your life that you're never going to get back. But you're not getting younger. I, over the past years, you know, or year, have developed a lot of gray hairs. You know, and I'm sure it's due to stress as well. But I'm not getting younger. And I, you know what I can't do? I can't take that hourglass and just start back over. It doesn't work like that. You know what it means? I, I just backslid and I just lost all that time. When I could be here, now I'm here. And hopefully in six months I can be back to where I was, you know, a year ago. You lose the time that, that God has given you. Your life is but a hand breath, the Bible talks about. You know what a hand breath is? I just showed you. <laughs> breath is with. It's saying this, this. You know the point? It's saying it's not even the length of your hand. It's the width of your hand. It's short. It's small. It appeareth for a little time and then it's gone. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be 50 years old before you know it. You're going to be 60 years old before you know it. Get back to Bethel now. Amen. Get back to where Amen. you were now. If you're behind, hey, if you never left, then you know what I have for you? Then just push as hard as you can forward. Amen. Start, you know, you, you, you still, don't get complacent with where you are. Get, if, you're, if you've backslidden, get back to where you were. Make the decision now. Jacob made a real decision. And you can make a decision and say, I'm, I'm going back to where I was. I'm going to get back to where I was spiritually. I'm not wasting any more time because the longer you wait, the less time you're going to have to do it. The less likely you are to do it. Same thing with people, you know, when we get them saved and get them back. Oh, hey, you're more likely if you do it now. Do it right away. Amen. While you're thinking about it, while you're contemplating it, get back to where you were. Get back and have a zeal of soul winning. Get back and have a zeal of reading your Bible. Get back and have a zeal of coming to church and singing the hymns and living for God and walking in the Spirit. Amen. Being peaceful and happy and walking in the law of the Lord Amen. and loving God. Get back to Bethel. Get back to your spiritual walk with God. Amen. Amen. Look at uh, Genesis 35. Look at verse 8. It says, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Alan Bekoth. Now, I want to I touch on this in a moment. Because this a uh, couple of, of, of tragic things take place almost at the same time. And I'll go ahead and plant the idea in your mind now. Notice when Jacob decides, hey, I'm going to do something great. Tragedy hits. Someone that's close to him dies. While he's there. Because where did they bury her? Bethel. This isn't where he's moving to where he's going to live. He's just going there to build an altar. So this happens while he goes to this rededication, if you will. It's going to be a revival. Look at what it says next. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he, and he called his name Israel. Now we know that this is the, a reiteration, right, of what we saw previously. And this is a blessing. It says that he blessed him. Oftentimes when we see names being repeated like that, or names being given a new name, it's a blessing. The Bible talks about that, uh, uh, that we're going to have a, uh, we're going to be given a stone with a name written on it, right, that no man knows, right? It talks about Jesus having a na name that no man knows. It's speaking of it in a positive light that it's a blessing. So there's a blessing here that he's given a new name, and this name represents uh, something that God has for him to do. Of course, Israel means a prince, basically, is what he means. He's going to be a prince. Uh, look at what it says in verse 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob 
set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Like I had mentioned before, notice that he's, he's having to go back and doing the same things that he did before. If we went back to Genesis 28, it's the same exact thing. He set up a pillar. Remember, it was the one that he had for, the, for his pillow. He set it up as a monument, and he anointed it with oil. Same thing he does here. You need to go back and start doing the same things you were doing before. Like I mentioned, soul winning. Like I mentioned, reading your Bible. Like I mentioned, you need to start doing all of those things again. Get back and start doing the same things that you were doing before. <clears throat> and uh, like I read, verse 15, we'll read one more time. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel, <coughs> excuse me, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed. And she had hard later, labor. Now notice this is them while they're returning. She had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So this is when Benjamin was born, is when they're actually returning back from Bethel. They're leaving Bethel. Now, if you go back up in verse number 8, it says, And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. Now, I'm sure that that was very uh, uh, bothersome to Jacob. Uh, that, I'm sure that was very bothersome to Jacob uh, that, that Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. I'm sure it was a very close relative, very close, uh, uh, not necessarily relative in the sense of a family member, but uh, a close friend. I'm sure she was very close to the family. I'm sure it was very hurtful to Jacob. Notice such a, such a, a, a grievous hardship taking place in a moment of, 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 of goodness and righteousness where someone's turning back to the Lord. And then right after you see the death of, Re of Deborah, which is Rebecca's nurse, you see God blessing him. So in the midst of all these trials and tribulations, you see this bad thing taking place, right? And then if that's not enough, when Jacob is returning, it says that Rachel dies. Now, if you're familiar with the relationship that Jacob has with, with Rachel, at least how Jacob perceives Rachel, he loves Rachel very much. So this is, how do you think Jacob handled this? I'm sure it was very hard. I'm sure it was very hurtful to Jacob. Notice how a hardship can hit in the middle of, some, in the middle of a revival, right? You can have a... Now, <clears throat> do you know it's Satan? No, you don't know. Sometimes it's just life. Life is filled with bad. You know, life is filled with a lot of bad things. It's a, a, a sinful world uh, uh, that, that has been cursed, right? There's a lot of hardships and problems. Death is just the result of sin itself. And death is, is sad and it's terrible. It's one of the worst things in the world that, that takes place. To have the death of a close relative, the death of a, maybe the closest person to you, which is probably Rachel, right? But you know what you still need to do? You still need to serve God. You, it doesn't change anything. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Even if, God forbid, someone were to lose their spouse in here. You know what you need to do? Nothing should change. You should keep serving God. And I'm not telling you not to, not to mourn. You know, I'm not asking you to be Ezekiel, right? If you know the story of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's you know, told to be a picture. And God actually takes away Ezekiel's wife. It says with, the, with the something of the hand. I can't remember. One, with the stroke. He takes away his wife. And it's meant to be a picture unto the nation of Israel. And he tells him, don't mourn. I don't want you to mourn at all. Now, obviously, that was for you know, a purpose. Hey, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to mourn something like that. That is, that's, that is going to take time to get over. But you know what? Don't stop serving God. And if you're in the middle of a revival, try to keep that going. Because that's ultimately what's going to matter in the end, is how much you've done for God. You know, people are going to come, people are going to go. My parents are, are going to die. My father, my mother, your parents are going to die. They're going to pass away. You know what? At the end of it, it hurts when it happens. And I'm not saying that you're not going to, you know, it's not going to, you know, there's not going to be a little bit of pain, the splinter there that stays with you forever. But at the end of your life, you're going to look back and you're going to say, man, I wish I would have served God more. You're, no matter what, you're going you're gonna to have regrets about how much you've served God and what you've done for Him. You know what Jacob should do as hard as, hard as it is to say in a situation like this? He should, he should continue that revival. He should try to continue doing what he's doing for God. Don't allow a problem like this to send you right back. You know how he could have reacted? 
I'm going back to where I was. I'm going home. Oftentimes when a person uh, is put into a state like that, especially a leader, they'll just let everybody else do whatever they want. They'll just stop kind of supervising them and saying anything to them. They'll just kind of stop because you know what? They just don't care. They can become depressed, right? You think that would be good? Every, Rachel passed away. It's terrible. It's sad. It's his loved one. It's his wife. It's the one that he, you know, he, he adored the most. But he's still got a lot of people looking up to him. He's still got his children. He's still got a lot. He's got a lot. He's got, God just blessed him. You think God wanted him to just, just fizzle out? You think God didn't know that, that was going to happen? That Rachel was going to die? Why did God give him this great blessing and tell him to be fruitful and multiply? Right? And he's, and he's, and he's confirming, uh, you know, uh, basically the same thing with Abraham with an oath here. He's confirming it the second time. Let me word it that way. He confirms it the second time because he brings up the second time to him. You know what he's wanting to do? <clears throat> he's wanting to strengthen him. So in a hard time like this, you know what you need to do? Don't backslide. I understand that's hard to say. You say, hey, you've never been in a situation like that. I'm just telling you what you should do. Don't allow a problem or something, even horribly tragic, to allow you to get out of church and stop serving God. Life goes on. Hey, it's sad. I understand. I'm not being... You know, it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm being, you know, uh, uh, you know, just not being sympathetic, right? But I'm telling you in the big picture, you just need to, you need to serve God. Don't allow that to get you off track when something great is going on, right? Keep serving God. Mourn, cry, be sad. But don't lose the big picture. Don't take your eye off of the goal, which is Jesus Christ. Don't lose the big picture. Hey, I don't know what's going to happen in everybody's life. And you're going to have tragic things. I've said this before, but even a room this small with this you know, amount of people in it, there are going to be bad things that happen to the families in this room. Some of them terrible things. It's just statistically. I, God forbid, I hope not. I pray for everyone here. God will have His hand of protection. But you know what? It happens because it's life. God doesn't always intervene, Right? Sometimes they, they, you know, God maybe, you don't know, this could be a punishment to Rachel. I'm just totally, that's total speculation, obviously. But Rachel, we know, had idols. I'm just saying, reading the Bible and stuff, maybe this was chastisement to Rachel herself. Maybe this was a problem. Think about the strange gods being put away. Maybe this is a problem Jacob should have taken care of earlier. And they had the strange gods from among them. You remember, J uh, Rachel actually had, the, had uh, uh, Laban's idol. She could have been one of the people that got rid of that strange God. It's possible, isn't it? We saw that she has a past history of that. It might have been too late. That Jacob should have put his foot down earlier. This might have been a punishment uh, to Rachel. Right? You know what you need to do? In hard times, you need to try your best to keep serving God. Amen. Don't get out of church. Don't allow that to throw you off. Don't allow... You know, uh, as, as grievous as it is, it would be that much worse if you just thought about that the rest of your life and became just this, this depressed, depressed nobody who didn't do anything for God. Right? Keep serving God. Keep serving God. Look there what it says in um, verse 19. Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. This is one of the verses that I pointed out previously when we were looking at uh, a couple other chapters when Ephrath was, was mentioned that Be it's actually Bethlehem. So it's actually uh, one other time I believe in the book of Judges is where it's found where it tells you that Ephrath is Bethlehem. Verse 20, And Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelled in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. <clears throat> we'll stop right there. I just want to, uh, real quick, let's go to Genesis 49. We weren't going to turn to this, but we'll turn to it real fast. One thing that we can learn from this, because this will be the last thing that we look at, and then the rest of, of this we're just going to be reading, uh, and then we'll close for this evening. One thing that we can learn from that, of course, fornication is terrible, it's wicked. Uh, you know, we see him uh, basically going in, going in unto his father's wife. Uh, it would be very similar probably to what took place in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's not necessarily his, it's not his mother, but he's going in unto his father's wife, his concubine, right? I mean, that's obviously extremely wicked. Extre fornication and adultery, anyways, is super, super wicked. Super wicked. How much more 
committing such an act against your father who loved you and took care of you and did these things for you. You know, um, it's obviously a terribly, terribly wicked thing. It's horrible. And it hurts even more when it's someone that's close to you. Oftentimes when someone commits adultery, it's someone that they know closely, a friend or something like that. That's terrible, the betrayal that you feel. Imagine your own son doing something like that to you and finding out that your wife committed such an act with you know, your son. This actually was a curse. This brought a curse upon Reuben. And uh, the firstborn, of course, receives the blessing. The firstborn is, 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 is uh, supposed to inherit the blessing. Well, we know, of course, that he didn't receive that. They all each got a blessing. He blessed them and prophesied to them uh, individually. And, uh, but it wasn't the full blessing and it wasn't uh, the blessing that was given to Judah of the seed of the king, of the Messiah that would come one day. That wasn't given to Reuben. It ended up being given to Judah. It ended up being given to Judah. You see, you notice that it skipped two other generations. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Those three obviously committed horribly heinous acts, right? And the next in line, because that's I just named them off to you in, in their actual uh, uh, chronological order of their birth. So notice, Reuben, for what he did, look at what a great thing he lost out on. Simeon, Levi, that was terrible, that was huge. And notice when the prophecies are prophesied of the blessing, notice what it says in Genesis 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his, called unto his sons and said... Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Why is he saying all those things? Because it's his firstborn. That's the point. The firstborn is supposed to be the leader. He's supposed to be the strongest. It's his firstborn son, right? He's supposed to guide the rest of them. And, the, and, and we see that that blessing was, given to the, was supposed to be given to the firstborn child each time. But notice what it says next in verse, in verse 4. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. There, couch in the Bible means bed. You have an example of that right there. But that's many, many times in the Bible. Then you see Simeon and Levi. They're given more of a curse. And then you see Judah in verse 8. So notice how the generations afterwards, they suffered because these curses and these blessings... Now the whole nation of Israel overall in a way received a physical temporary blessing by dwelling in the land of Canaan and, and being a part of the nation of God. But Judah got that real blessing, which is the promise of that Messiah. And of the line of Judah came the king, you know, came, came the Lord, right? The Savior. That's the blessing you want. That's the real blessing. That's the most important thing, right? But notice that the generations afterwards, and I've pointed this out before, they suffered because of the sins of the Father. And that happens. This, this, this concept is all throughout the Bible. And I'll give you the most obvious, famous example. Your you know, uh, uh, fleshly father, Adam, you suffer because of his consequences to this day. That's a punishment, right? The Bible talks about in, in Exodus chapter 20 of the Lord, it says, visiting the iniquities upon the, upon the fathers, I believe. The sons of the, of, the, of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. I kind of messed that up a little bit, but along those lines. So he visits, visits those iniquities. You can bring curses upon your children for the life that you live. You can. You know, uh, let me give you an example. Do you know how likely it is if somebody grows up in a household where their father and their mother are a bunch of drunks, how likely they're going to be a drunk? Look at people in your life. Super common. Super common. Well, guess what? The opposite is just as much true. How much more likely are all these kids to go to church if you go to church? How much more likely are they to pray every day if you pray every day? How much more likely... So note, you have a choice whether you can pass a curse, a problem, a transgression, basically, down to your children. You, you, your children are inheriting things from you. They're not only inheriting your genes and your, your, your DNA, right? Your physical traits. They're not only inheriting your money, right? Which in my case, my kids aren't going to get very much. No, I'm just kidding. 
They're not only inheriting all these types of things, but, but we need to lay up for our children a spiritual inheritance. We need to have them set and ready for life. Amen. We need to have them ready to live a strong Christian life. And not allow them to be like Reuben, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. I don't want my kids to be unstable as water. I don't want my kids to, to not be able to excel. That didn't only apply to Reuben. Do you know what that means? A lot of those things, when you, when you read about it, it'll be something that has to do with that person. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Reuben was unstable as water. He said, thou shalt not excel. But then that passes on down to those other... You know, some, of the, some of the things that are, that are mentioned about, like, Levi, talks about them, him being scattered. Right? And you know who that applies to? The nation of... Uh, or the, yeah, I'm sorry, the tribe of Levi. They were scattered. Why? The tribe? Because they were the priests. So they were all over. Right? So you can see how, you know, in different areas, how these, 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 these things can be passed down. You can pass something down to the next generation. You know, set your children up with a good spiritual inheritance. Set them up with a spiritual inherit inheritance. Put the whole concept together, the whole idea together. If you're not serving God, start serving God. Start serving God. If you've got sin in your life, get the sin out of your life. Get that junk out of your life. Bury it under, tr under a tree and never go back to that tree and shake them again. Get it out of your life. Change your garments. Get rid of the filth and the sin in your life. Get the filth, wherever it is, wherever you have access to it. Don't make provision for the flesh. Get rid of it. Get rid of it and go back to where you were before. If you're backslidden, get back to Bethel. Get back to where you were before. Get back to the house of God and serving God and start doing the things you were doing before. All the things that God wants you to do. Start doing all the things that, that God has for us again. Get back to where you were, right? Amen. And lay that spiritual inheritance for your children by doing so. Start setting a great example for your kids. Start taking time with your children and teaching them what a man of God or what a woman of God is supposed to look like. Right? Teach them how you want them to be as adults when they grow up themselves. Let's finish reading here. So we begin in, uh, in verse number 23 here. This is uh, all of the children of Jacob. It, it begins with genealogies, and if you just flip over, if it is a full page for yourself, my text is a little larger, uh, but if you flip over there, if you look all the way to Genesis 37, um, so Genesis 36, and then these verses that we have here at the end of 35, it's all just genealogy. So the, the context, if you notice the paragraph marker, uh, really begins there in verse 21, spills over, and in verse 23, we have the genealogies beginning, and they go all the way through chapter 36, all of chapter 36. And then there is our next delineation. It begins speaking of stories and things, other things that took place. So we'll end here, verse number 23. Look with me. The sons of Le Leah, <coughs> Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, and Nephali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padanaram. And Jacob came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. sojourned. In verse 28, And the days of Isaac were in a hundred and four score years. So that's a hundred and eighty years. Verse number 29 says, And Isaac gave up the ghosts and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Just two quick things I'm going to point out real super fast. Number one, once you notice Isaac lived, it's very interesting. You may not have thought about this, but Isaac lived a lot longer than he thought he was going to. Uh, Jacob was 20 years with Laban. Isaac thought he was getting ready to die when Jacob fled. And then he gets back and many more years go by and then Isaac dies at that point. So even when he thinks he's on his deathbed, he's like, hey, I'm getting ready to die. Bring my son in here. He lived many, many, many more years after that. Many more years after that. Uh, and then not only that, uh, I want you to notice that the, it's interesting what's interchangeable here. And I don't believe that it's because, it, I believe there are two things, of course, and, and I kind of explained this in the sermon that I preached about the spirit, the soul a little bit, and soul sleep uh, doctrine. Verse number 29, it says, And Isaac gave up the ghost. Now, ghost is, of course, interchangeable with spirit. That's life. So your life is saying that he, that he gave up the ghosts in his life, right? Uh, in that same sense. 
I want you to look at verse number, you may or may not have noticed this, but this is another point debunking the soul sleep doctrine. Uh, look at verse, <clears throat> uh, where is it at? Verse 17, verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing. Now you may or may not have noticed that before. I almost forgot to mention it. As her soul was in departing. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and people that subscribe to the soul sleep doctrine, uh, they believe that the soul is just your being. That's what they say that it is. That it is your being and it just refers to your body, that it is not a spirit. And, they, and, and this is what they are adamantly against. That the soul cannot be separated from the body. And that the soul is just your lively or your life, you being alive in your body. They don't believe that there's like a, a soul spirit like separation. You understand what I'm saying? They believe it's just you, you being your existence or your consciousness is what they would say in your body. That's why they believe that when you die, you just cease to exist. Right? Until they believe, you know, the resurrection. Like they believe like death is like 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 dead, like nothing's going on, like there's nothing. Nothing's up there, you're nowhere, right? It's obviously totally false, it proved false so many ways. But this is one example of where the soul you can see is distinct from the body and it exits and leaves the body. It says the soul is in departing. The, other, the greatest example I believe is 1 Kings chapter number 17. It's when Elijah goes to the widow woman right, right after all that takes place. The, 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 the son dies. And uh, Elijah prays and says, let this child's soul return into him again. This is 1 Kings 17. Right after that, the Holy Spirit, just so you know the narrator, says, and the, and the soul of the child entered into him again. So we have a verse where the soul departs. We have a verse where the soul enters into him again. You know what that tells you? The soul leaves the body. It leave, it, the soul can leave the body. That's why you have souls under the altar in Revelation uh, chapter number uh, 5, right? Or 6. Revelation chapter 6, you have the souls crying under the altar. Right? You have the, the rich man. You know, he dies and he goes to hell. And it says, in hell, and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. That's a soul. Right? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this night. We thank you, dear Lord, for the grace.